Admitted sex abuser and accused sex trafficker Jeffrey Epstein was found injured and nearly unconscious in his jail cell yesterday in what many friends of Bill Clinton are calling a clear case of attempted suicide. We will examine what is really going on in this sordid saga. Then Ilhan Omar says more terrible things. The media melt down on Bob Mueller's weak testimony on Capitol Hill. And finally, the mailbag. All that and more. I'm Michael Knowles, and this is The Michael Knowles Show. Of course, Jeffrey Epstein was found injured in his jail cell. Of course he was. Now, there are many theories flying around about this. I would never engage in the notion that the Clintons have obviously killed people. I would know. We will, we will analyze, joking and sort of joking aside, we will analyze what is most likely going on here and uh, what this injury is all about. But first, we have to say a quick thank you to our friends over at Quicken Loans, who provide support for the Michael Knowles Show, Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Your home is so much more than a house. It is a little slice of heaven. And that's why when you find the perfect place, getting a mortgage shouldn't get in the way. I live in Los Angeles. You know how impossible it is to find a good house there. Uh, but the, you know, you, you go around all these neighborhoods, every house is seven zillion dollars. And compounding this trouble is that in our generation, nobody knows how to do anything practical, like deal with mortgage companies and get a loan. Fortunately, Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans is there to help. Their team of mortgage experts is obsessed with finding a better way, which means that their number one goal is to make the home buying process smoother for you. They have industry leading online lending technology developed in the heart of Detroit. They are absolutely changing the game. They make the home buying process work for you. They're there with award-winning client service and support every step of the way. For most people, buying a home is going to be the biggest investment they ever make in their lives. Don't screw it up and don't leave yourself out there to be taken in by a lot of complicated processes and people with bad motives. Use the best. Quicken Loans has helped millions of Americans achieve their dream of home ownership. And when you're ready to purchase the home of your dreams, they can help you too. Their team cares about getting you home. They are ranked the highest in customer satisfaction for primary mortgage origination nine years in a row and highest in mortgage servicing five years in a row. You don't need to just take my word for it. They are repeatedly being shown to be the best in the game. When you work with them, you get more than just a loan because Rocket Mortgage is much more than just a lender. Visit rocketmortgage.com slash Knowles, K-N-O-W-L-E-S. Do it right now. Take the first step toward the home of your dreams. Equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, nmlsconsumeraccess.org, number 3030. Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Push button, get mortgage. Just that simple. Jeffrey Epstein, admitted sex abuser of young underage girls, accused sex trafficker of young underage girls, has lots of very rich and wealthy and powerful friends all over the world, and he winds up injured at the point of death in his jail cell. So what is going on here? Is it the case that Bill Clinton's hitman didn't finish the job, or is there something else going on? I'm kidding. I'm mostly, I'm mostly kidding. Let's look at the facts first, and then we can examine the three possibilities of what's going on here. Jeffrey Epstein, he's not being held in the private wing of the Palm Beach County Jail anymore like he was 10 years ago. He is being held in a real tough place, the Metropolitan Correctional Center in New York. For comparison, this is the place El Chapo was held. This is no joke. This place has been described by people who have been there as worse than Guantanamo. This is a real real tough place. A 2011 report from Amnesty International said that conditions in the Metropolitan Correctional Center are, and in particular the the 10 South Wing of that correctional center, amounted to, quote, cruel, inhumane, or degrading treatment that was, quote, incompatible with the presumption of innocence in the case of untried prisoners whose detention should not be a form of punishment. So this is a a hardcore facility. He, He also was housed with somebody named Nicholas Tartaglione. Nicholas Tartaglione, with a name like that, you might think he could be associated with a particularly criminal aspect of the Italian-American subculture, but no, he actually is a former cop. He's a former cop who became a dirty cop. He got involved in drugs and drug trafficking and ended up killing people, so he's there too. There are three possibilities, I guess really four possibilities here. One is that Jeffrey Epstein actually attempted suicide. 
I mean, this guy is facing what will amount to life in prison and not a pleasant time in prison. So he could have actually attempted suicide himself. Or he could have faked a suicide attempt in order to get himself transferred to a better jail, since he's in basically the worst one you can possibly be in right now. Or one of the very powerful people, one of the many most powerful and richest and connected people in the world that he is associated with, who he could possibly bring down because he has dirt and blackmail on all of them, would very much like it if he winds up dead. And then the fourth possibility is that this guy that he was in the jail with, Nicholas Tartaglione, uh, was the one who tried to kill him. I, I think this last one is the least plausible. It's not like we're talking about him being housed with some white supremacist gang member who's trying to make a name for himself or something. Uh, he's being held in a private wing, particularly and specifically to combat those threats. He's already had threats on his life from people in the general prison population. So uh, the, the idea that some ex-cop who's also being held basically on his own is going to be the one to off him. I just think that's not very likely. And the people who are familiar with the situation are saying that the cop and Epstein basically got along and were doing fine together. So I, I don't think it's that one. I think it's one of the three. An actual suicide attempt, a fake suicide attempt, or one of his powerful friends, former friends, trying to shut him up before he can expose their crimes. Now, this last one is the one that's trending on Twitter right now, uh, the Clinton body bag count. You know, there's been this meme that's gone around for 25 years now that the Clintons kill a lot of people because all of these people that have been associated with the Clintons wind up dead, not just Vince Foster, who worked for the White House very famously in the 90s, but a lot of other people too. Now, if you look at any one of these deaths on the Clinton body count list, it just doesn't seem likely that they killed him. The cumulative effect is sort of compelling to people as, as far as memes on the internet go. I, I'm not saying that the Clintons have killed people. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is the reason that this meme, this idea has made it this far and has lasted for 25 years is because we all know that the Clintons totally would kill people, right? We all know that these are absolutely, thoroughly dishonest, corrupt psychopaths to the core I mean, the Clintons lie like it's the air. I mean, there's no, they have no regard for the truth. They have no regard for loyalty. And they, they are vicious, psychopathic people. So the reason the meme has lasted is because we all, we all know that they would do it. <laughs> now, that doesn't mean they did do it, and I don't think they did it. What I, it is certainly possible, though, that many of the other very wealthy and connected people that they're, that Jeffrey Epstein is associated with, might try to do that as well. I mean, let's not forget the Southern District of New York found a Saudi passport in his safe, a Saudi passport from the 80s with a different name on it, but with his picture. What does that mean? We, we can, I think, assume at this point that Epstein is a pretty high-level sex trafficker. Was he maybe providing some favors for people in Saudi Arabia? Well, how about all of the other high-powered people around the world that he's, he's palled around with over the decades? It's not implausible at all that someone would try to knock, knock him off. Now, the, the one reason that I think this is not likely in this case is because he's being held at a very serious place. El Chapo wasn't able to break out of this place. I'm not convinced that someone could very easily go in and off Jeffrey Epstein at this Metropolitan Correction facility. So let's for now table that idea that someone's trying to kill him. Plenty of people have motives too. Plenty of people would do it. I just don't think that's likely here. Number two, did Epstein actually attempt suicide? Jeffrey Epstein is a completely shameless individual, right? He has flaunted his sexual proclivities and his sexual businesses for 20 years now. He has an island that people called Pedophile Island, private island. He has a plane that people called the Lolita Express, in, a, in profiles of Jeffrey Epstein, people joked about how, President Trump joked about how he was always around those younger women. He really liked younger women. This is a guy with no shame whatsoever. He's already copped to sex with underage girls 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago, and he continues to do it even to this day. I don't think he has any remorse, any regret, any shame at all. I think it's very unlikely that he would try to kill himself, which brings us to the third possibility, which we'll get to in one second. But first, I have got to say thank you to my friends over at Zip Recruiter. Zip Recruiter is the only way to hire people. 
ZipRecruiter is the only way to get hired. ZipRecruiter sends your job out to over 100 of the web's leading job boards, but they don't just stop there. That's what everybody does. They'll just, okay, they send the job out and that's it. It's like throwing spaghetti at the wall. What ZipRecruiter does though, the reason they're the best in the game is because of their powerful matching technology. So ZipRecruiter will scan thousands of resumes or more and find people with the right experience and invite them to apply to your job. So you're not just throwing spaghetti at the wall. ZipRecruiter is actively going out there, finding you the right candidate. Then once they do that, as the applications come in, ZipRecruiter analyzes each one and spotlights the top candidates so you will never miss a great match. ZipRecruiter is so effective. It is so out of the league compared to all the other guys that four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a qualified candidate through the site in just one day. So right now, my listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free at this exclusive web address. And you have to go to this one. Pull over. Stop what you're doing. Go to ZipRecruiter.com slash Knowles, K-N-O-W-L-E-S. ZipRecruiter.com slash Knowles. You know, we, we hire people all the time and it's, it, it can be very difficult to get quality candidates. Time is money, guys. Don't waste your time. Don't waste your resources. Just go for it. ZipRecruiter is the way to get quality candidates. I, I can't even think of a second place. This is the way to do it. ZipRecruiter.com slash Knowles, K-N-O-W-L-E-S. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. So I think all things considered, no matter how depraved the Clintons are, no matter how much clout and power all of his other foreign friends have, former friends, I think it's unlikely that someone tried to kill Epstein here. I also think it's unlikely that he tried to kill himself. What I think is actually going on is that he faked a suicide attempt. I think he faked a suicide attempt because all Jeffrey Epstein wants is to get out of this jail. What he really wants is to get out on bail. He made this exorbitant, absurd offer to get out of jail on, on bail. The trouble is, once he gets out on bail, he's going to flee the country, right? There's no chance that this guy is sticking around. He's got his own island, for goodness sake. He is a Bond villain. So the judge, rightly, was not going to let this guy out on bail. Uh, next best case would be to get out of this awful El Chapo prison facility and go to a nicer prison. And if that means that he's got to pretend to hang himself or something or choke himself for a little bit, I think it's, it's likely that he would do that. Um, he, he was taken to the hospital. Apparently the injuries were not that serious. If this were a hardcore suicide attempt, first of all, it probably would have worked. And, uh, and also it would have, it would have resulted in more serious injuries. By the way, this is another reason why I don't think it was a hitman, you know, I don't think it was the, the black gloved uh, assassins of the Clintons or somebody like that, is if it were the black gloved assassins of the Clintons, Jeffrey Epstein would be dead. <laughs> he wouldn't be around to tell the story. So I, I don't think it's that. I think it's a cynical ploy to get out of jail and to, uh, to either get out on bail or go to a place that isn't so horrific. Um, I mean, th this is a very high level guy, Jeffrey Epstein. This is a, a top tier operator in politics and finance and crime. And uh, I, I wouldn't put anything past him. So I hope that he stays rotting in that facility. And I hope they keep him on protection. I mean, I hope they continue to protect this guy because in fact, there are a lot of powerful people in this country and around the world who would like nothing more than for Jeffrey Epstein to turn up dead before he can sing on them. Speaking of child abuse, speaking of child abuse, about, what was it, three days ago, I think on Monday, we talked about this guy, Jessica Yaniv, a man in a dress who sauntered into a Canada beauty salon. It's run by immigrant women and they do Brazilian waxes for women. And he insisted that they wax his scrotum and, and they said no. And now he sued them out of business. And he's done this to 16 other beauty salons. And everyone is trying, uh, people on the left at least, are trying to portray him as a victim. Trying to say, oh, he's, you know, he's, he's a transgender woman transgender women are women. That's what we're told. And it's, it's awful that he's getting this kind of treatment. Turns out, as I could have predicted, this man is a sexual predator. Who could have guessed? Could you imagine? It's now come out that this man, his name is Jessica Yaniv. I don't know what his name was before he turned it into Jessica. He was sending very charged sexual, sexual messages to a 14 year old girl when he was 27 years old. Yaniv was, in these text messages, which have now been leaked by the girl, Yaniv whines that the girl is not yet 16. 
and therefore, because of age of consent laws, he cannot, quote, do anything with you, like four U's in there. In other messages, Yeniv, close your ears if you don't want to hear something truly disgusting. In other messages, Yaniv asked to see the girl's menstrual pad. 14 years old. He was a 27-year-old man. Still is a man, but back then he was acknowledging that he was a man. Then, in another instance, he sent a voice message in an Elmo voice, a Muppet voice, and he was singing, Jessica Rumples, that's the girl's name, breasts bounce up and down in a little childish Elmo voice. He also told Rumple that he was horny, and he followed it up by telling the girl, why are you always so beautiful, LOL, and then he sent her a video of a sex toy. This guy, Jessica Yaniv, is the villain from season one of Another Kingdom. If you haven't seen Another Kingdom, that's the podcast that I did with Drew Clavin, the, the villain is this kind of transvestite, androgynous, criminal hitman figure who speaks in a lilting, muppety voice. This, this guy is him. This guy is the villain. And it shows you, the reason I bring it up is not because of what a weirdo this guy is or how awful it was that he ran those women out of business up in Canada or how awful it was that some people were defending him. I bring it up because it shows you what just a little change of language can do. Right? This guy, we knew nothing about this guy. All we knew about him is that he wore a dress and put an immigrant woman out of business. And you had some people defending him because he's an oppressed victim. We were told that this is a woman. What the left presented this guy as is as a transgender woman. Now, a woman is always a victim compared to a man in the intersectional hierarchy of victimhood. And a transgender person is always a victim compared to someone who believes that he is the biological sex that he is. So he's a double victim. He's a, he's a transgender woman in the victimhood language. In reality, though, what is he? He's a male predator. He's not a female victim. He's a male predator. Criminal. Just that little change of language. Beyond this guy, Jessica Yaniv, if you go over to the stories we've been hearing around the country of Drag Queen Story Hour, do you remember this? All, all around the country, for some reason, at public libraries, they've had something called Drag Queen Story Hour, where little kids are brought in to have stories read to them by drag queens, men wearing very sort of sexualized and sensational makeup and women's outfits. Now, they had a drag queen story hour at an event in Portland, and the library is celebrating it. They're posting photos of it. We were told, those of us who objected to drag queen story hour, we were told, you're awful, you're bigots, you're transphobic, you're a hateful person, you're hate mongering. That big debate that broke out on the right between So Rob Amari at First Things and David French at National Review over cultural conservatism versus libertarianism, that debate was kicked off by Drag Queen Story Hour. So Rob Amari's piece said, look, when we reach Drag Queen Story Hour to children, we have gone too far. We need to re-examine some of our libertarian premises. And what so Rob and other people were saying is this, this amounts to child abuse. It's not, maybe it's not physically abusing children, but it is so confusing. It is so utterly absurd, the ideology and the gender ideology that you're uh, indoctrinating these kids with. We should not do it. All called haters for that. Well, guess what? Turns out that the photos have now been deleted, but the library posted photos. Uh, apparently as part of this drag queen story hour in Portland, Oregon, the drag queen who would come in would lie down on the floor and then encourage all of the kids to crawl all over him. Mm. What does that have to do with reading a story at a public library? That's pretty weird. Just imagine for a second if a straight man wearing a business suit walked into a public library and said, okay, I'm gonna, what I want to do with my time is I want to come in here once or twice a week and I want to read books to a lot of like little children. I want the little children to gather all around me and then I'm going to lie down on the ground in my business suit and then I'm going to encourage the kids to crawl all over my body. Okay, is that, is that cool? Of course not. The guy would be arrested if he did that. But because the man puts on a dress and makeup, the pop culture, the leftist culture celebrates it takes photos of it, is so blind by their ideology 
that they upload the photos to the internet as though this is perfectly normal and worth celebrating. It's insane. That is the effect of ideology. That is the effect of language. Because, because, if, if, a, if a woman, let's say a young woman or a mother or something, came into the library and she was kind of playing around with the kids and they, maybe they were on the floor, you know, and she was reading the story to them and then, I don't know, a kid jumps on her back or something, right? Because mothers are nurturing, because women are nurturing, it, it would be a little weird, but it wouldn't be that weird. It wouldn't be as weird as if a straight male in his 50s came in in a business suit and said, hey kids, I'm going to lie on the floor, rub all over me, please. But for some reason, when you say it's a, it's a man wearing a dress who looks like a woman who's transgender, when you add all of these different layers of apparent victimhood to it, then it's to be celebrated. Then we're going to post pictures of that. What it shows is the currency of victimhood. In Texas, it's not just this one drag queen story hour in, in Portland. In Texas, when people objected to drag queen story hour, same thing. Or you're a bigot. You're a transphobe. You're a hater. Turns out one of, the, one of the guys who was coming in to do this drag queen story hour was a convicted sexual predator. He was a sex offender. Maybe they should have checked that, but they're so blinded by their ideology because of the language and because of the currency of victimhood. If you can claim victimhood in 2019, you can do anything. You can do anything you want. And, and this, we were talking a little bit yesterday about how the left abandons their pet victim groups when something better comes along. So they abandon legal immigrants for illegal immigrants, right? Initially, they were, they were the champions of legal immigrants. Now they're the champions of illegal immigrants. But legal immigrants don't tend to encourage illegal immigration. They're, in fact, legal immigrants are some of the least likely people to encourage illegal immigration because legal immigrants did it the right way and they waited in line. And illegal immigration takes spots away from people who are waiting there in line to be legal immigrants. The left abandons women for men in dresses. Remember, the left used to champion women's rights, feminism, women's liberation. Now, what the left is doing is saying, hey, women, you can't have your own sports. Women, you can't have your own scholarships. Women, you can't have your own bathrooms or your own locker rooms because now we champion men in dresses. Now the left is abandoning children for men in dresses. Think of the children. Think of the children. Remember that? Now the, the left is saying, no, no, children, crawl all over that man. Yeah, let that man lie on the ground and you can crawl all over him. They will do whatever gives them the most control. And the reason this transgender issue matters I mean, we've talked about what the pronouns mean, the effect of the language, but think about what the effect of the language is over time. The reason that the left is so interested in this transgender issue is it gives them the most control because it cuts right through the politics and the culture to who can define reality itself. This transgender issue is not a mere political issue. It is about ontological control. It is about who can define the nature of reality. Compared to that, illegal immigration is nothing. What does illegal immigration do? Let's say we bring in, I don't know, we've got, a, let's say we have upwards of 30 million illegal aliens in the country. We have an amnesty, illegal aliens keep pouring in. Let's say we've got thir thir 30 million. Well, if the vast majority of them are likely to identify as Democrats and vote Democrat over time, okay, that gives Democrats political control. They'll own the Congress, they'll own federal elections, and they'll own a few states. But the transgender issue doesn't just give them political control. It allows them to define what is contrary to nature itself. That is an incredible amount of control. That's why they're willing to put up with just about anything. They're willing to tolerate, even encourage anything in order to effect that. Speaking of radical, awful leftists, we have to turn for a second to Ilhan Omar, who has said another terrible thing. Now, if we covered every terrible thing she said, the whole show, this, the whole show would be called Michael Knowles plays clips of Ilhan Omar, because we would have about 10 of them every single day. But here is one that is so outrageous, and it's getting a lot of play on social media because people are defending her, and we just need to break down how absurd it is. Here is Ilhan Omar. She was asked by a constituent, if she would condemn female genital mutilation, which is something that's widely practiced, practiced in Muslim countries and in her own home country of Somalia, here is her response. Your second question is an appalling question because I, I always feel like there are bills that we vote on 
um, bills we sponsor, um, many statements we put out, and then we're in, um, in a panel like this, and the question is posed, could you and Rashida do this? Yeah. And it's like, how often should I make a schedule? Like, does this need to be on repeat every five minutes? Should I be like, so today I forgot to condemn Al-Qaeda. Uh, so here's the Al-Qaeda one. Today I forgot to condemn FGM, so here it goes. Today I forgot to condemn Hamas, so here it goes. Very frustrating question. It's a very frustrating question. Well, it's pretty frustrating that you won't give an answer. It's not like this is coming out of the blue. It's not like people are, are asking Ilhan Omar every single day to condemn Al-Qaeda and she keeps doing it every day. I mean, compare this to President Trump. How many hundreds of times has President Trump condemned racism, condemned the KKK, condemned David Duke, condemned neo-Nazism, condemned white nationalism? It seems like he has to do it every three minutes, but he keeps doing it. And after the hundredth time, he says, guys, how much do I have to do it? And he keeps doing it anyway. When has Ilhan Omar condemned Al-Qaeda? Ilhan Omar giggled about Al-Qaeda, giggled about Hamas, giggled, this is all on video, giggled as she compared Al-Qaeda to the United States, compared Al-Qaeda to the U.S. Army, compared Al-Qaeda to England, drew a moral equivalence between the United States itself and Muslim terrorists. She has fought hard to get lenient sentences for uh, young men who have tried to join ISIS. She has uh, prayed that Allah awaken people to the evils of Israel and accused Israel of, of hypnotizing the world. She has said some pretty radical things that pertain to radical Islam and Islamic countries. In her home country of Somalia, 98% of women and girls are subjected to female genital mutilation. And this has become a problem over in Minnesota. Now it's true, Ilhan Omar voted once on a non-binding resolution to condemn female genital mutilation. She also voted on uh, an amendment that would have allocated some money to fighting this problem. But when you're constantly joking, laughing about Al-Qaeda, when you're not addressing these issues, it is not bigoted, it's not hateful, it's not Islamophobic to come out and say, hey, Ilhan Omar, you say a lot of crazy, weird, scary, anti-American things. We just want to be sure you oppose this, right? And she just won't give the answer. She goes on. Look at my record. I voted for bills um, doing exactly what you're uh, asking me to do. I have put out statements upon statements. There's a bill in, in Congress. There's a resolution that I am the co-author of that I voted out of the Foreign Affairs Committee. And so I am, I think, quite disgusted, really, to be honest, that as Muslim legislators, we are constantly being asked to waste our time uh, speaking to um, issues that other people are not asked to speak to because the assumption exists is that we somehow support and are for Right? No, they, there is an assumption. So I want to make sure that the next time someone is in an audience and is looking at me and Rashida and Abdul and Sam, that they ask us the proper questions that they will probably ask any member of Congress. Yes, there is an assumption among a lot of people in the country that Ilhan Omar might have some sympathy for Al-Qaeda. But that's not an assumption based on the color of her skin. That's not an assumption based on her religion. It's not an assumption based on what country she was born in. It's an assumption based on her many statements that have shown sympathy toward Al-Qaeda and other radical Muslim terrorists. It is an assumption based on her actions which have shown sympathy for radical Muslim terrorists. And I don't think it's unreasonable to ask her to condemn them like even just one time. Imagine if, if, if Donald Trump were giving this answer. Someone asked Trump, like they always ask him, do you condemn racism? And he said, I think this question is appalling. I think what guys like me and Mike Pence and other white guys, and he just names a bunch of white guys, we're being asked because of the color of our skin to condemn racism that's an outrageous, how many times, I'm never, I'm not going to give an answer to that. And I don't want anyone to ever ask me that again. 
There is a lot more evidence that Ilhan Omar has sympathies for Al-Qaeda than there is that Donald Trump is a racial bigot. There is way more evidence. But Ilhan Omar gets to give that non-answer. She gets to refuse to condemn Al-Qaeda and female genital mutilation because she gets to claim victimhood. And President Trump, who has repeatedly done all of those, those things, gets no similar benefit of the doubt. That's the power of language. That's the power of the, of the left taking control, not just of political or even cultural issues, but they are trying to control the definition of reality itself. And they're, they're doing it in a very sophisticated and clever way. They're doing it by, by taking control of, of what reality is, of what a man is, of what a woman is. And, the, and through this radical ideology of intersectionality, the only objective reality that you can point to, the only objective truth, is the truth of victimhood. And coincidentally, they're the arbiters of that victimhood. It's a brilliant political strategy, and we've got to oppose it because it is extraordinarily dangerous. Now, we will get to a lot of mailbag questions. We have to do that in a second. But first, I have got to invite you. Come. Come on in. I'm in a hotel room right now in Washington, D.C., I'm going to be giving a talk at the Young America's Foundation on next Tuesday. But if you're not in D.C., if you're not checking out YAF, you have to come to our backstage live show. We're going on the road, special one night only event, August 21st. We're not going to be doing more events like this this year. This is the one time at the incredible Terrace Theater in Long Beach, California. Ben Shapiro, Daily Wire, God King, Jeremy Boring, Andrew Clavin, and me. We will all be chopping up the winners and losers of politics and pop culture. Best of all, we'll be answering your questions from the audience live, so make those questions good. Tickets are available at dailywire.com slash backstage. There are still a few VIP ticket packages available. I've actually seen people, I'm at TPUSA right now, and I've seen people that I met at our last event that we did for the Daily Wire, which was about this time last year. These are great opportunities. We all love talking to you guys, and uh, we think it's fun for the audience as well. So just come on out. It's going to be a great time. The VIP packages have premium seating, photos and meet and greets with all of us, a gift from Shapiro, and so much more. Head to dailywire.com slash backstage. Get your tickets today. Go over to dailywire.com slash backstage. Do it. Pick up a Leftist Tears tumbler while you're at it. We'll be right back with the mailbag. All right, we're going to burn through these questions today. From Matthew, Michael, ex Lothario of the Daily Wire. I'm an ex Lothario? What, did I, what happened about that? Maybe because I'm married. I sent you a question a few weeks ago about when to kiss a girl I'd been on a few dates with. I kissed her on the next date. Good job. And she held my hand. Good job. Two days later, she tells me she's not ready for a serious relationship, but this upsets her because I'm this perfect guy, 100% a gentleman, and I'd managed to sweep her off her feet. Now, apparently, he didn't sweep her too much, I'm sorry to say. I think we saw, uh, she saw a future with me, saw that it was different than what she had in mind, and panicked. I'd like another shot at her, but I'm not sure how to go about it, given the circumstances. Any advice you can give on this front would be appreciated. Hashtag came for Ben, stayed for Michael. Happy Feast of St. James and keep up the good work. Thanks. Yours, Matt. Very difficult position you are in, my friend. So, a couple options. There are really, I guess there are only two things that could be going on right here. One, you really did sweep her off her feet. She really does think you're a great guy. She really sees a serious prospect with you, but she's just doing her now. She doesn't want a serious relationship. She's focusing on her job or on school or she's going to move or I don't know, or she's still got a thing for her ex-boyfriend. I don't know. So that's that's uh, one option is she could be telling the truth. The other one is she could be being nice to you and kind of letting you down gently, but, you know, and, and basically perfect guy, 100% a gentleman, all of that is uh, bogus. Either way, I, I don't think it matters which it is to determine your reaction here. If you really like the girl and you, you want to persist a little bit, then I would recommend it. You know, I, I've had to uh, be persistent and I think women reward persistence. They don't want some little timid guy who she says, I don't want to go on a date. And you're like, okay, I'm sorry. No, never mind. Delete my number. I'll, I'll never talk to you again. I, that No one wants that. However, you've got to be gentlemanly and you've got to be a little crafty here too. So this, this leads to another dichotomy. There are two ways that you can present yourself to this girl. You can either present yourself as 
okay, reserved, standoffish, you're not that interested, you totally respect her space and play hard to get and then maybe she'll come to you. Maybe you came on a little strong and she'll come back to you. The other way you can do it is be very upfront about your interest. You say, well, look, I think you're great. I really like you. I think you're beautiful and you're very interesting and intelligent. And so I want to go on a date with you and, you know, I'm going to be at this restaurant on Friday night and I sure would like you to join me and just kind of be that way. I'd keep it fun. Keep it light. Don't make it creepy and don't, don't be, you know, a stalker or something, but let her know that you are still interested and you're not that easily deterred. I think those are the two options. The worst ground you could be in is this middle ground where you're, it's just like timid and unsure and you're not sure if you're pursuing her or you're not pursuing her or whatever. I think it's perfectly legitimate to say, well, I mean, look, I don't, I don't think we need to, I'm not asking you to marry me. I'm asking you to go out on another date with me. And, you know, you're not making a lifetime commitment. I just thought we had a good time. And if you think that we had a good time, then let's do it. Now, she might tell you, okay, I was, letting, I was letting you down easy. I didn't have a good time, and I don't care, and I don't want to go out with you anymore. In which case, plenty other fish in the sea, kid. But there is also a chance you say, okay, maybe I, maybe I really do like this guy, and I'm afraid of my feelings, and okay, I'll go out on one more date. That's how I would do it. I've always been pretty upfront, pretty direct, and, uh, and I ended up getting to marry my high school sweetheart. Talk about persistence. I mean, that's years and years of persistence. So uh, good luck. You know, be confident. Keep it fun. Keep it light. Don't be creepy. Don't be a stalker. Don't be overly emotional. Don't be, you know, don't do any of those modern things that, that guys fall into. Act like a man. Go after what you want. And if she firmly rejects you, other fish in the sea. From Martin. Hi, Michael. Would it be a good strategy by Trump's team to now keep laying small bits of impeachment bait for the Democrats to keep obsessing over till 2020? Martin. Yeah, I think so. I think uh, all the threats of impeachment really help Trump. I think there are two good ways to do this. One is he wanted to add a question to the census that would have asked whether or not you're an American citizen. Obviously, this was perfectly legitimate. The Supreme Court didn't want to let him do it because John Roberts is a coward. So I would... Uh, if I were President Trump, I would issue an executive order to put the question on the census. And I'd, I'd have this legal fight going on, and I would have the threats of impeachment. He's already signaled that he's not willing to do that. He signaled that back on July 11th or 12th, I think. So I think it, that might be unlikely, but it would be a good way to gin up both popular support for him and antipathy for him in the House that might try to impeach him, and then therefore antipathy among the American people for the House Democrats. The other way that he could do it is the mass deportation of criminal aliens, which we were promised a week ago on Sunday, and it didn't happen, and we only arrested 18 people. I think that would be a great way to, again, do exactly the same thing, galvanize popular support among Americans, because Americans hate illegal immigration. Immigration is the top issue for Americans, according to recent Gallup polling. And so you'd get, get a lot of popular support. And because the Democratic Party has moved so far left, you, nothing would get them more ready to impeach than mass deportation of MS-13 gangster criminals. And so you'd get them to, to move to impeach, and that would, that would amplify the effect of support for Trump. So those are the two things I would do. Whether they're likely, whether Trump is willing to make that political risk, I'm not so sure. From Logan, hey, Michael, do you enjoy the Sherlock Holmes stories? I just started reading them and really enjoy them. If so, do you have a favorite story and why? God bless. Hashtag came for Ben, stayed for Michael. I do, in fact. I love the Sherlock Holmes stories. My favorite one is The Adventure of the Musgrave Ritual, one of the lesser known Sherlock Holmes stories, I think. And it's excellent. The reason I love it is it has to do with one of my favorite historical periods, namely the reign of James II, in England and Charles II and Charles, II, that whole area, uh, which has to do with a lot of religious wars and the last moments of the glory days of the English monarchy. So that's a good one to read. Also, what I like in addition to Sherlock Holmes is uh, the Father Brown stories, which is the same concept. Instead of just a regular private investigator, it's a, a Catholic priest who is a detective and he solves mysteries. And it was written by G.K. Chesterton, one of the great great modern writers, great writers of the 20th century, and, uh, or 19th century, right around, right around that time, turn of the century. And uh, it's just wonderful. He's got all of these stories, and they're the same kind of thing as Sherlock Holmes. And the, the one to start with is The Innocence of Father Brown. 
from Cody. Hey, Michael, my daughter is a high school senior this year and interested in positively affecting the culture. However, she has no background in debate and gets terribly nervous and tongue-tied whenever she ends up engaging with some whiny leftist. What advice would you give her for improving her skills in fact, memory, and civil discourse? Thanks for all you do. Cody. I'll give an answer that probably no other political commentator will give. Your daughter should take acting classes. That's the way to do it. I don't think debate class or the debate team is going to do it. I don't think she needs to read a million more books of modern political philosophy. I don't don't know that that, those are all fine to do. Acting classes will do wonders for her ability to debate leftists, to understand the world, and to retain things that she reads. In a former life, I was an actor myself, and that training I call upon every single day. President Reagan was asked how an actor can be president, and his answer was, how could the president not be an actor? And in a, in a very technical way, it teaches you how to memorize. You know, there are many different ways to memorize. I mean, I, I could basically look at a sheet of paper and memorize what it says with 95% accuracy within about three to five minutes. But I'll forget it within two hours. Now, there are other ways to memorize where I, I have monologues, speeches, things that, poems that I memorized 15, 20 years ago that I still remember today word perfectly. Uh, so you, you will learn those things in acting classes. You will learn to think on your feet. Acting is, is reacting to imaginary circumstances and living truthfully in imaginary circumstances. So it makes you much more adept at responding to questions that you get from the audience or to points made by another debater. It, it makes you have a greater stage presence. It makes you more self-possessed. And it allows you, I think very importantly, to analyze the human condition from an artistic perspective. Too often, we want to make our politicians into robots. That's why they end up like robots. So they, all they do is think in ideology and this political doctrine and that political doctrine. That, that doesn't tell you very much about human nature. It, what tells you much more about human nature is literature, art. Man is artistic. All we know about our earliest forebears, the cavemen, we don't know whether they clubbed their wives on the head. We don't know exactly what they ate. We don't know exactly how they hunted. We don't know exactly how they lived. All we have from their civilizations, more or less, are paintings on the wall of the cave. All we know about them is that they were artists. And it is through art that we can come to understand human nature much better than we can through some political doctrine. So maybe sign her up for an acting class. Maybe have her watch some acting classes on YouTube, have her memorize poems, have her read plays, have her memorize speeches, have her really work through all of that. This is a a real difference between practical knowledge and uh, book learning. You know, you you can only learn so much from books. You have to embody the rest of it. You have to enact the rest of it. And what better way to enact than in an acting class or an acting setting? Last question from Danielle. Danielle. Hi, Michael. I'm curious about your opinion of genetic screening, the idea of being able to spare a child's life, a pain pain and suffering by way of genetic screening for disorders is curious to me. Is this selfish for the parent to want a healthy child or is it selfless to make the decision so a child isn't strapped with the issues that come with that? Excellent question. I was just discussing this yesterday. I obviously oppose it, as I suspect you do too, in the case of screening for abortion. So you, you do genetic screening and then there's, they find some problem with the baby and then you kill the baby. Nobody wants to do that. That is just intrinsically evil. However, if you are screening because you can identify some disease and maybe these days even operate on the baby in the womb and cure the disease so that they will have an easier life or they'll have their sight or they'll have a, they'll have a physically healthier life, that's perfectly fine. That's a, a wonderful thing to do. It's, it's no different than giving medical treatment to someone who is out of the womb or someone who is 30 years old or someone who is 70 years old. It's a good thing to do that. This is not to say that people who are born with physical deformities or they're blind or they're deaf or whatever or mental deficiencies are, are worse or they have less human dignity or they... No, not at all. Actually, the, the, the fact that everybody is broken and people have needs is a, is a wonderful gift to us because we can then act out of charity and it enriches uh, our experience of humanity and experience of one another. It, it makes life worth living. But 
if you can help your child, whether your child's in the womb or your child is 10 years old, absolutely you should do it. There is nothing immoral about that. Okay, that's our show. In the meantime, I will see you on Monday. Till then, I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Michael Knowles Show. See you then. The Michael Knowles Show is produced by Rebecca Dobkowitz and directed by Mike Joyner. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Senior producer, Jonathan Hay. Our supervising producer is Mathis Glover. And our technical producer is Austin Stevens. Edited by Danny D'Amico. Audio is mixed by Dylan Case. Hair and makeup is by Jesua Olvera. And our production assistant is Nick Sheehan. The Michael Knowles Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2019. Hey, everybody, it's Andrew Claven, host of The Andrew Claven Show. Well, yesterday's Mueller hearings exposed the Russia hoax for what it is. And listen, it's not that I enjoyed seeing the Democrats and their media humiliated. Oh, wait, that's exactly what I enjoyed. You'll be able to hear me gloat shamelessly on The Andrew Claven Show. I'm Andrew Claven.